Atlántida. Welcome to another episode of Issues and Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. I am Melissa Joseph. In this episode, we're speaking with the Senusha Bureau of Standards, and this bureau is having an upcoming basic food safety training seminar that's taking place on the 30th of March, 2022. To discuss with us the program is the head of the certification department at the Bureau of Standards, she's Dr. Zen Dubizon. And thank you so much for speaking with us in today's program. Thank you, Lisa, for giving us the opportunity to do so. Let's talk about the why of the seminar that's coming up before we get into the, the nitty-gritty of what the seminar is going to cover. Um, we know that we've, we've, we've increasingly seen a, a proliferation of eateries around St. Lucia. Um, and for the Bureau of Standards, I mean, given what your mandate is, you have a pulse on that uh, sector. So talk to us about the sort of uh, food training programs that you've had over the years. Okay, like you rightly said, our mandate is that of the protection of the health and safety of consumers. And we have a food certification program. And that food certification program um, looks at certification of food establishments um, to food hygiene. Of course, whenever we do certification, we do it against the requirements of standards. And way back in the early 2000s, while we had the program, we were administering the certification program, we recognized that a lot of persons have not received formal training in food safety, and that still continue to exist. So we started the program and um, definitely as COVID happened then, we recognized that um, there was no training and um, we need to resume. So this is why we actually have in this session. So we're hoping that persons take full advantage of it. And you mentioned COVID and as I indicated, we've seen a proliferation of eateries around the place, some of them formal establishments, others are just like little pop-up shops. Um, and that, of course, we understand the economic impact that COVID has had on the society. So people are increasingly finding ways of being able to earn a livelihood. Mm -hmm. So this sort of ad hoc uh, uh, growth that we see in, in, in the uh, food sector, how much of a challenge does it pose for institutions like the Bureau of Standards when you when you deal with uh, food safety? Yeah, um, like I said, through our certification programs, when you go into these establishments, you, you, you see the different practices. And even as consumers, we go into establishments and what we do see, we realize, I mean, there is definitely need for more training in food safety. And even like when we say the term food safety is basically, it's a concept that when you eat food, that it will not make you sick. But guess what? Most persons, when they get sick from eating food that is not safe, they don't really reach the healthcare facilities. They would stay at their home, and the only time they would go is when they're extremely sick. And um, we recognize that we really need to do something about it, So, which is why we need to ensure that persons are adequately trained in food safety. And this training is really a it's basic, so it's really the, the different practices that one should engage in while preparing food so that persons who eat their food remain safe. So let's break down that concept. Um, so when we talk about food safety, what does it really mean? Yes, yeah, so food safety is basically the concept that when you eat the food, that persons will not get sick. That is, of course, if it's eaten, according to the instructions. Because if, for example, you were to buy a particular drink, a beverage, and you're told that that beverage has to be kept below four degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. But 
of course, like we do, like maybe on a Saturday that we shop, we buy the products and all throughout the day we have the beverage in the hot car and of course that can make you sick. So our training looks at everything in the food chain from the time the product, the raw materials are procured to the, the materials being stored, to being used to prepare the food, to how the food is served, to how the food is packaged, to how it's distributed, transported, and of course, to how consumers eat it, which is why the label is important as well, informing persons as to how the food should be eaten, how it should be stored, how it should be prepared, etc. Very interesting. You know, you know, we normally simply refer to it as food poisoning, uh, but as you rightly said, people stay home until they get critically ill. That's not the time they seek yes. they, you know, medical uh, attention. But so food poisoning as food foodborne illnesses, it's a very, very serious thing. And in the aspect of being able to handle how you handle the food in the preparation stage really um, determines how one wants someone eats that food or whether they are eating contaminated food or not. So if you could t talk to us about what then causes uh, the uh, foodborne illness. Okay, so there are many hazards that are need to be considered or that exist and those hazards are divided into three categories so you look at biological hazards and these are those that you will get from bacteria from viruses from fungi um, there are others chemical hazards and chemical stems from the farm the other uh, the pesticides the fertilizers that are used you need to ensure that the correct concentrations are applied and also that these things have withdrawal periods as well so when it's used then there's a period within which the product can be harvested um, there are other chemicals that we use while we prepare food that can also harm you which is why they need to be applied in the right concentration so all the food additives that we use even some food colorings and Allergens is something also that comes under chemical hazards as well. So we need to consider allergens and we realize that the list of allergens keep increasing. So even celery too has something like celery is an allergen as well. Can you believe that? And so, and then you have other hazards like physical hazards, um, whether it be um, stones, um, wood or anything physical that would find itself in the food plasters which is why the establishments need to ensure proper hygiene when it comes to preparing food how are plasters used um, when persons handle food if they have an injury what should they be in the food or should they not based on um, what they have so these three um, hazards if not controlled can contribute to food becoming unsafe. So it can be, and um, when you get sick, you might have a, an infection, be it from a bacteria, or it can be a chemical that make you sick, or something that will cause injury, you bite it, and there's a hard stone in the food, and then you break a tooth or something. So basically those three hazards are what we need to control while preparing food. Right. So in terms of the practices now in order for you to be able to uh, keep th those uh, hazards to the very very minimum or non-existent at all um how do you go about ensuring that those steps are, are, are taken um so keeping the place clean separating the foods and as you mentioned earlier the temperature yes. and so forth okay there are the world health organization has actually introduced just five basic steps in preparing food. Um, so the first one is keeping clean. And when we look at keeping clean, we speak about um, cleaning and sanitizing. We speak about um, even you as the food handler, how do you keep clean? You need to be clean when you're dealing with food, washing of hands. And we know now with the pandemic, hand washing has become um, very important, um, not just in preparing food, but I mean, throughout your daily activities. Um, also, um, separating your raw and cooked because sometimes you would go out and even while persons, you would see in the barbecue grill, raw and cooked food 
together. Yes, you see that all the time. Yes, and even the same um, utensil that they used to pick up the cooked food, they would use that same one to pick up the raw food. And sometimes it's just a lack of knowing. They're not aware. And this is what the training brings to, to, to mind, an awareness of what you do and how it can impact on the food. Also, temperatures. Um, cooking thoroughly is also important. So, and you know, we have a culture where even with the pork, you go, you buy grilled pork and it's not properly cooked. So cooking thoroughly is very important, as well as the temperatures um, that you keep. So if a food has to be cold, you keep it cold. If it has to be hot, it's kept hot. And even when we go and we buy buffets, the buffet has to be kept at a particular temperature. And all these things need to be monitored. But sometimes you go to establishments and you see cold food being served. And sometimes persons are not aware of that. They're not aware that at room temperature, that microorganisms can proliferate if the food is contaminated by mishandling it. Also, using um, your raw materials. Where do you get your raw materials from? You have to buy from reputable suppliers. And all these elements, that is what we're going to be discussing at the training. So it's really just five critical steps that you need to follow and remember when you're um, preparing food to eat. I, I know that for people at home uh, as well, they must be saying, but you know, you know, frying fish, for example, or you're frying chicken, for example, and you, you mentioned about using that same utensil that you are put, you're putting in and then you're taking out. out. And, but uh, t tell us about why is that so dangerous? Because it, it seems so small, yet there is an inherent danger in doing mm -hmm. that. Okay, there are some products that would naturally have microorganisms. For example, something like chicken. There's a tendency that chicken can have salmonella in it. There's a tendency that beef can have E. coli in it. And these are bacteria that make you sick. So if, like you said, you have the raw product that you use the utensils, the utensil becomes contaminated with that bacteria, and then you put it onto the raw product, the, the cooked product, that you actually take in to serve me, then guess what? You do have that bacteria present on the cooked stuff. And then I eat it, I become sick, I have a little diarrhea, I stay home, I'm not that sick. So a lot of foodborne illnesses, they are underreported. And that's one of the problems, underreported. Until it becomes a very crisis a situation. Yes. Now, for the Bureau of Standards and, and, and this training program coming up on the 30th of March is targeting um, the food, food establishments, correct? Yes. Are, are, you, are we looking at all sizes or are you looking at uh, the, the small micro? Everyone, Everyone, because once you're a food handler, and it's important to note when we say you're a food handler, whether it is you're handling a product that is packaged and ready to go really out, so. you are a food handler. So whether the food is cooked or whether the food is um, unpackaged or whether it's packaged and you handle, once you're handling food, you, you are a food handler. And we're targeting everybody. So everyone. across the spectrum, including uh, supermarkets? Yeah, because they would handle the food as well, um, as well, to put the food on the shelf. So that's very important. And um, so we're handling everyone and even the housewife, because I mean, there's so much that we do. I, I mean, we have a culture growing up that you would take the product out, the, the frozen meat, and you leave it on the counter for God knows when. Yeah, because people say yes. they want it to defrost, and they yes. really want it to thaw. Yes. <laughs> so, but, so you leave it there for, for the uh, you know, whole morning, hours over and, four hours. You know, and <laughs> you go in and you're doing your washing and everything else, and then you mm. have it there, or the meat is soaking, and <laughs> so that yes. you can have it to fall out so but you're saying these practices are not best yeah they're not best okay um and especially when of course you handing food that you're going to serve to consumers so we'll pick up uh, with the conversation right after this short break in with me from the senior bureau of standards is dr senf dobizon keeping hands clean is important for good health however after a disaster staying clean is hard to do especially if there is no pipe-borne water. Simple things you can do, stay clean and remain healthy are 
wash your hands with soap and clean water. If these are not available, sanitizers with alcohol are options. Wash your hands many times during the day before preparing food, eating, caring for a sick person or baby, treating a cut, wound or sore. Wash hands after using the bathroom, changing diapers, caring for animals, caring for sick or injured persons after handling garbage. Washing your hands is one of the best ways to prevent illness. For further information, contact the Bureau of Health Education at telephone number 468-5349. And welcome back to our discussion here on Issues and Answers with Dr. Zen Duvizon. And we're discussing a basic training in food safety. And it's a training seminar that the St. Lucia Bureau of Standards has coming up on the 30th of March. Before we went to break, we were discussing some of the practices, and even within the home setting, and uh, we were talking about the cross-contamination that can happen by using the same utensil with raw and cooked foods, especially meats and fish, mm -hmm. etc. Um, but another practice, uh, as we were saying, is the leaving the, the, the meats out for it to thaw, to thaw out, and not healthy at all because you can create a situation where the food can become uh, contaminated. Yes, you can have the multiplication of bacteria if the food it has bacteria in it. So what about the practice too and, and uh, of having the, the meat thawed, maybe you change your mind, you've left it out for a period of time, you change your mind, now you're going to put it back into the freezer. How th does, is that a safe practice as well? Well, it's really not the best practice. Um, when you, which is why when you thaw in food out, you're supposed to thaw it out in the refrigerator. But most times you're very impatient um, because it takes quite a while to thaw out in the refrigerator. So we just put it out on the counter. And as like we said, this is not a good practice because at room temperature is really a temperature where bacteria can multiply. And um, I mean, they grow very fast. So once that food is out and it's contaminated, then the numbers become millions in no time at all. And you know, some people believe that if they've cooked that food, the meats, it, it, and it's out there, uh, that um, perhaps you, you cook it perhaps late in the evening and you want to use it for the following day, that it's okay that you could simply leave it out on the stove top. Well, <laughs> that's a very dangerous practice, leaving food out. Foods should not be left out at room temperature for more than four hours. And that's a basic rule in preparing food. So if it's out more than four hours, mm -hmm. then the food establishments would have to throw that food away because you don't know. So it's a basic rule. Okay, you don't do those things at all. Yeah. Now, for the Bureau, I, I know that the, the, the handling of food is, is one component of what you do when it comes to food safety. Now, don't you walk us through some of the other elements that the Bureau of Standards is engaged in when it comes to food safety and certifying establishments, um, you know, a walkthrough of, of, of in terms of what is needed to ensure that these establishments are correctly uh, practicing the, 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 the various steps for, for food safety. Okay, so like we said, the first step is to ensure that you are trained in food safety and we realize there's a need for that based on practices that we see while we do inspections, as well as even while we as consumers um, go out to various establishments. So it's very important um, that with our food certification program, it's voluntary, like I said, um, but with that program, you would need to have your license to operate from the Ministry of Health, which is a regulatory requirement. And uh, once you have that, and we also want to know that you've had some formal training in food safety. So it's not just about having the health card, but with that comes training. So even if you have a health card, you need to know that if you are sick, you don't work when you're sick. So it, it, it really emphasizes, you know, the different practices that, that you need um, to engage in. So once um, you do that, um, you apply to our programs, then we, it, have an inspection of the establishment. So we go, we look at your process, we ask questions from the time you buy the raw materials to the time the food is prepared and so it's, it's packaged and it goes out to the consumer. So we look at all these various elements in our food certification program. And once that is okay, then you get a, a 
certificate of food hygiene. So it gives consumers that level of, of you know, assurance that, you know, there are certain um, practices um, those establishments engage in to ensure or to try to reduce, because sometimes you can never be 100% safe. So at least you reduce the possibility that the food is unsafe. And uh, how do you keep the surveillance? Because, you know, you, on, the, on the initial uh, engagement with the establishment and so forth, yes, everything will be great. But how does the Bureau now engage in the surveilling of these establishments to ensure that all is maintained all the time? Well, you're right on track with the surveillance aspect of it. Uh, so we have each of our, the, the certification program involves an unannounced surveillance audit. So throughout within like six months or so um, we go in to assess the facility again to ensure that they continue to do what they're supposed to do as well as complaints so if we get any complaints on any establishment that we have certified it's also an opportunity for us to go in and to investigate what is happening because it has happened before we go in and investigate to ensure that um, they actually follow in good practices, hygienic practices. Right. And the seminar, again, as we said, is for the 30th of March. Now, given COVID-19, you know, any other time, you would have seen that the Bureau of Standards would have, you know, in your offices, you would have gotten all the scores of people coming in. Mm -hmm. But now everything has to be done on mm -hmm. the virtual end. So talk to us about how you are facilitating um, that seminar virtually. Okay, the information is available on our website and you can actually go on the website to register and by registering, of course, we'd, we would um, know that you have registered and once you've paid, you will get a link via Zoom indicating that this is the link to join the session. And of course, um, I mean, throughout the training, we are going to make it interactive to ensure that everybody is engaged because we know that we do have um, some challenges when it comes to online training. Some persons are behind and they're not actually engaged, they're not participating. So we definitely plan to make it very interactive so persons participate. Right. And at the end of the uh, session, a certification for the participants? Yes, they will receive a certificate indicating that they have been trained in food safety. All right. So. Uh, the I know that we, we started off talking about COVID-19 and while there is absolutely no evidence that COVID-19 is transmissible um, via food, um, but certainly um, how you handle the surfaces of where the food is being prepared is important because the science does say that uh, COVID-19, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus can uh, survive on surfaces for a period of time. Uh, so uh, would the uh, seminar speak in any great detail to how you really take care of your surfaces, that physical aspect of where the food is being prepared? Yeah, most definitely. And like I said, it's one of the first um, practices, keeping clean and keeping clean, keeping your surfaces clean and even you as the food handler, you're preparing the food, you need to ensure that your practices, if you touch any part of your body, that you need to wash hands, frequent hand washing, to ensure that when you serve me, for example, if I go to buy food and you serve me and I handle the package, my hands become contaminated if you have contaminated the product. And then unaware, I would go touch my nose, touch my eyes, touch, put my hand in my mouth or something. And then um, that way, you can become, um, I guess, sick. <laughs> and, and that's what we are trying to, to avoid, avoid at all costs. At all costs. And so the basic training in food safety, again, being undertaken by the Senusha Bureau of Standards, it's really to provide participants with the knowledge of basic principles for the production of safe food in an effort to reduce the risk of foodborne illnesses. And as we commonly say, food poisoning. Mm -hmm. And it's being held virtually. The training includes PowerPoint presentations, discussions, and group activities, which is what you speak to about being able to engage individuals yes. so it doesn't become a monotonous session. Yes. 
Definitely. And uh, in terms of the who would be leading um, the, the various sessions, it's broken down. It's an entire day from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, so you have various presenters for the, for that training? Yes, definitely. We have actually three presenters for the training. So like you said, it would break the monotony of that one person speaking all the time. So we have some real competent persons to actually deliver the training. <laughs> And so you want to give us the, 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 are the it's now in, in sections, various headings, topic areas? Yes. To give us an idea of what the topic areas may be. Well, we've divided it into the five keys to safe food. So as we go through the keys, then we highlight all the different practices to ensure that food is kept clean. When we go to the next step, um, cook thoroughly. How do you ensure that it's cooked thoroughly? We go through all the different steps to ensure as that um, we cover the five keys. So basically, it's like five segments. All right. And uh, so, interest so far in for individuals, uh, we've been able to monitor the traffic coming in on the website. We've seen people uh, expressing an interest to participate. Oh, yes, most definitely. <laughs> we have quite a few persons who have registered. All right. And you too can be part of that training seminar. Very, very critical. Um, it's happening on Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. It's a one-day training session, so it's not taking away too much of your time. Um, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., it's happening via the Zoom platform. And uh, once you have completed the entire day and you've um, made sure that you've participated in the group activities and so forth, just to show, right, the Dr. Dubizon, to show that you've now had a full comprehension of what the day's exercise was, and then you'll be able to earn your certificate of participation at that time. So don't forget, all food handlers, it is a call out to you for you to participate in this training program. For more information, you can contact the Senusha Bureau of Standards. The telephone number is 453-0049. You can also call 456-0102 or 456-0102. 0546. You can also simply log on to the Senusha Bureau of Standards website and you will get all of that information right there. And the registration is happening online as well. Yes. Okay, so everything you can go on there. Do believe that you can also, uh, the QR code there that you can click. All of that is on the website for you to be able easy facilitation nice. for you to participate in the basic training in food safety offered by the Senusha Bureau of Standards. Any parting words from you, Dr. Dubizon, yeah. as we say goodbye? Yes. I also want to say if you have any problems registering online, you can call and we'll facilitate the process for you. So I invite everyone, well, <laughs> the food handlers, as many as possible to take advantage of this training that we're going to have and of course, there's a discounted rate um, before March 15th. Right. And so uh, Dr. Dubizo speaks about the rate. It's not entirely costly. It is $100 of, uh, for you to, uh, part uh, to participate. And uh, you also get, um, if you register and you pay before February 28th, you get a 30% discount. And there's a 20% discount if you pay before March 15th. Uh, so, and it's a very minimal cost for Definitely. something that is of such great benefit. Yeah. Well so, Dr. Dubizon, I want to thank you so much for coming in onto Issues and Answers and discussing with us uh, the food safety. Very, very important topic there. We all eat and we all want to make sure that after that good meal or whatever mm -hmm. it is that we've eaten, we, we feel we good again good. to go the next <laughs> round. Dr. Dubizon is giving a chuckle. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and we do hope that for all those of you, the food handlers out there, that you register so that you can participate in the basic of training in food safety offered by the Senusha Bureau of Standards. I'm Lisa Joseph. See you next time.